So what's here? We're going to take a look at machine learning and why so? Because Apple actively advises developers to improve some intelligent features or new experiences but by leveraging on-device machine learning. And the project we're going to improve with the image processing is a super simple app that uses the drawing classification ML model provided by Apple. It, the model was trained on the NIST database of handwritten digits. So basically what it does, you place a collection of images of handwritten digits and also the results of their recognition by this model. So as you may see, the results are not as good as we'd wish them to be. Uh, why does it happen? Hi everyone, thank you for joining me here and for being here in general. So we're going to be talking about digital image processing in Swift and how it can help us build better apps and how we can use it in general. So that's me. My name is Alina. I'm an iOS engineer and I love playing with different algorithms, especially image processing algorithms, as you can see. So I'll try to show you what's so great about them and how can you also use them. Uh, you can also check out my Medium page, I try to post there some ideas I find interesting, so probably you'll find the link somewhere in the end. So the plan for this talk is the following. Uh, first, we're going to review the theoretical concepts and ideas uh, of digital image processing in general. Then we'll take a look at available instruments for image processing with Swift. And then we'll see what we can do with those instruments. So we're going to be looking at some code there in the end of the presentation. And now we're going to dive deeper in each of these parts. So, First, we're going to need to define what exactly digital image processing is and of which processes does it, cons does it consist and uh, how, how can we work with it, how can we understand it. So this may sound pretty obvious, but the field of digital image processing refers to processing digital images by means of a digital computer. Uh, let's take a look at this definition in more detail because we're going to need it to, to work with it properly. Starting from the word processing, image processing is basically a process of transforming some image or performing some operation with that image in order to get enhanced or changed image or to extract some features from that image, some data we probably can need. Uh, usually an input of such process is an image, I think always it's an image, but uh, an output can be either an image or some features, some bunch of data associated with that particular image we passed there as an input. As an illustration for enhancing or changing an image, uh, you can imagine sharpening the image. I, ho I think you've all done it before. And also it can be blurring an image or just changing colors of an image, making it grayscale. It's also an image processing already here. So extracting information from images may sound even more fun, at least to me it is so. Uh, we can get the amount of unique colors uh, of an image. We can also check the opacity value of an image or even make some conclusions about the object present in an image. That's actually where the image processing intersects with computer vision and machine learning and we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit later. So that this are the, this are the processes of image processing. Uh, going back to our definition, fortunately, I hope so, we all know what a digital computer is, so we're not going to dive into this, these words. We're going to move on to the next concept, and it's a digital image. An image, and any image actually, may be defined as a two-dimensional function f from x and y, where x and y are basically spatial coordinates, and the amplitude of f at any pair of these coordinates, x and y, is called the intensity or the gray level of the image at that point. Color images are basically the same f from x and y function, but based three times for um, different color channels. Uh, as you can see, it's RGB, red, green, and blue. But still the same function uh, from the spatial coordinates. When x and y and these amplitude values, they're all finite discrete quantities, we call an image a digital image. And that's the type of image we're going to be working on with the processing algorithms. But if the values are continuous values, uh, like flow, we can call it an analog image. That comes from analog and digital signals, actually. 
Uh, in other words, a digital image is composed of a finite number of elements. Each of these elements has a particular location, x and y coordinates, and some value. These elements, they're referred to as picture elements, image elements, or simply pixels. Pixel is probably the most widely used term for this uh, element of digital image. In a standard image representation, the pixels are equally spaced in a two-dimensional matrix, uh, like you can see here on the screen, but there are also other representations and that they are also acceptable. For example, in Oxide displays the three, three primary colors, they are located at different places on the pixel grid in a staggered pattern, like a, like a check desk. Uh, the shape of pixel can also vary. We were all used to the square pixels and in regular monitors, regular computer monitors, they are square. But in other systems such as widescreen, widescreen format of uh, digital video standard 601, if I'm not mistaken, the pixel is rectangular. So basically the pixel can take almost any shape uh, or size. Uh, actually, the pixel is the smallest part of an image, uh, so the image, the digital image, can be thought of as a two-dimensional array of pixels, where each pixel takes on a specific shade, opacity, and or color. And depending on the color system, different amounts of memory can be allocated to define each color component of a pixel. For example, there are binary images that, that can contain only values, uh, color values or, of 0 or 1. The memory is one bit, actually, to represent this 0 or 1 value. Uh, there are also monochrome images whose pixels represent shades of gray. These images are also can be called grayscale images. The allocated memory is 8 bits, but, which means that the range of colors, uh, the, the color can have a value from 0 to 255, so basically 256 different values there. Uh, for color images, the most systems have the allocated memory per pixel of 24 bits, basically a byte for each color component, but this also can vary. There can be 16 bit representation, 32 bits, and many more. So that, that really depends. Uh, basically, pixel is usually represented as one, in one of the following. It can be a grayscale, as I've already said, it's a pixel that represents different shades of gray, uh, where zero value is uh, completely black and 255 is like completely white, as we can say. And these values are usually an 8-bit integer in most systems we work with. Then there's RGB, uh, where pixel is made up of three integers between 0 and 255, and these integers represent of red, green, and blue. That's why it's called an RGB. And then there's RGBA, it's basically an extension of RGB, where we have those three different values and also one more, an alpha field, which represents the opacity of the image. Usually it contains uh, values from, from 0 to 1. Basically, th these were all the concepts, all the concepts, all, all the theoretical knowledge we need to have uh, to, to go work with digital image processing. Uh, but we don't know why to have to do it. So, why do we need it? For lots of reasons, actually. These are like more general ones. There are med medical image retrieval, so image processing can help us with the early detection of cancer. Then there's also traffic sensing technologies. It's it can be thought of as a video, a video processing, but a video is just a bunch of images, so still same image processing. And there's also image reconstruction. It's applicable for uh, both medical fields and also just all damaged photo you can reconstruct with the, with the algorithm of digital image processing. And then there's something probably more applicable to mobile development, uh, but not limited to it, of course. It's object detection, recognition, classification, basically machine learning stuff, computer vision stuff. Uh, here goes as well, for example, handwritten digit classification. And well, that's important because we're going to be looking at such project later on today. So how can we use image processing for image recognition or classification? Basically, by calling it image pre-processing. Uh, so the aim of image pre-processing is to improve the quality of an image or um, find some features of this image then, so we can analyze it in a better way. By pre-processing an image, we can suppress some distortions, we can enhance some features which are necessary for the, the exact, the particular application we're working on. 
but it's important to understand that these features they might vary for different applications so there is no like universal image pre-processing way that can be applied to all images or all applications so unfortunately no what are the instruments of image for image processing or maybe image pre-processing in Swift. So mainly it's Apple's native framework, it's core image. Uh, of course, there are, the, there are also some low level APIs such as Metal and everything, but they may be an overkill for simple apps. And uh, as we'll understand later today, core image is not about just filtering or I don't know, making your images in sepia tone or something like that, it's much more and it's enough to work with the simple apps and make them better. So basically core image, it's an image processing and analysis framework for both iOS and macOS. We're not going to dive into its history or how was it built, no, uh, but uh, it's important to remember that it existed way before Swift. So they, they, there may be some concepts or some approaches that most Swift developers are not used to, but it's still fine because uh, the, this framework is pretty simple and there, there's nothing to be afraid of here. Fortunately, uh, Core Image uh, offers uh, developers about 200 uh, ready-to-use filters and also a great base to build our own filters. For some processes, we may need an addition of shading languages, such as metal shading language, for, exa for example. We'll take a look at it later. But uh, generally, the main concepts and the syntax of the metal shading languages, they're pretty simple, so they shouldn't be hard to press. Filters, they're perhaps the most immediate part of core image framework. Uh, there are simple blurs, uh, color controls, some distortions. All of these filters, they can be used individually and applied to images, or they can also be chained together to create some unique effects that you may need in your apps. And the, the nice part about the filters and the filters API is that the filters that are chained together they're optimized in such a way that the image processing code of the individual filter uh, is concatenated together to build a single program, uh, which is actually awesome because this means, where possible, there are no intermediate buffers or any images, which makes the, the process of uh, basically processing these images uh, with, the, with the sets of filters very fast. And also, the, the filters themselves, they're very lightweight ob objects, so basically it's super fast for, for most of the filters, but not for all, unfortunately. Uh, the actual filtering work is deferred until the final result is required, so um, the filters are not ex executed until we try to render the final image. And also core image framework, it hides the technical implementation from the developer, or well, mostly. So whether filter is executed on the CPU or GPU or whether it uses metal, for example, it's hidden from the developers until we build our own filters, unless we build our own filters. So these are the mainly used classes of core image frameworks. It's CI image, CI context, and CI filter, basically, these are the most basic ones you need to understand to work with core image. But of course, there are, there are many more of them. This is just the basic. Uh, starting with say image. Say image is not an image at all. Uh, this class has all the information about the image, but the image, the final image is not rendered. Basically, it's some instructions to create the result, the output. Uh, filters accept the CI images as inputs and produce them as outputs as well. And only when the output is converted to a renderable format, that, for example, UI images can be, uh, only then the, the context builds and executes all the filters that are prepared to, to, for this image, for this particular image. So such images, they can be easily created from UI images or anything else, CG images, for example. And conversely, they can be a source for a displayable UI image as well. Uh, also, it's important to know that they are immutable, which means that they, they, they can be shared safely among the threads, and that's, that's great news. Then there's CI filter. Uh, core image filters, they are all instances of CI filter class, and they typically either apply some visual effects to, in, to an image that you passed as an input, 
or they generate a new image. For example, it can be a random noise or some solid color or anything. Uh, rather than subclass and CI filter, you can um, create any filters uh, from, from the scope that there, there exists. You can create by string name. The string names are hard coded into the framework, so you can find them somewhere in the internet or documentation, whatever you want. Uh, filters can be applied to still images, for example, CA images, or they can be applied to video frames because they're basically also a bunch of images. It's important to note that uh, CI filters, they're mutable, so they're not thread safe. And the last but not least, CI context. Uh, CI context is basically where all the magic happens. It's responsible for image analysis and rendering, and it's also responsible for compiling and running the filters. Uh, and everything this happens with performance in mind, which is probably the most awesome part here. A uh, basic initializer returns a context without a specific rendering destination. Well, specific for you, but usually it's CPU. Uh, it's also possible to create one with the needed rendering base if you need uh, to perform the filters on the CPU or GPU, whatever you want. Uh, CI context is also immutable, also as, a, as an image, as a CI image. Uh, so multiple threads can use the same CI context object to render the CA image objects. Actually, it's a good idea to do so. Please do so, because uh, creating a context uh, for a lot of times, uh, creating mul multiple contexts, it will require some resources and you definitely don't need it. And additionally, a kernel. Core image kernel uh, represents the program written in some uh, shading language, probably metal shader language or core image kernel language can be as well. Uh, and this program performs a filtering operation pixel per pixel. So each kernel, each program is called on each pixel of an input image. All core image filters, they contain at least one kernel, but some may contain two or, or even more. Uh, there are three main categories of these kernels. There are color kernels, warp kernels, and there are also general kernels, just simply kernels. And the color kernels, they are optimized for simply changing the color of an individual pixel. So basically, they don't know the pixel's location or anything more about the image. Uh, for example, it can be filtered to control the exposure of the image. It will be based on the color kernel, definitely. And then there are warp kernels. They're optimized to change the geometry of an image, for example, its size, so they don't know pixel color. Uh, it can be a crop and filter. Crop and filter will definitely be based on a warp kernel. And then there are also general kernels. Uh, they can sample multiple pixels in an image. They're used in filters such as blurs and sharpening when the filter or the program needs to know the values of surrounding pixels to form a new value for a particular pixel it, uh, it's processing. How to use core image filters? Well, we don't need to create individual classes for each image filter as uh, there is a single class provided for us. We basically use the string names, uh, specific names to initialize these filters. But we can still subclass CI filter in, or in order to create some custom filter effects. You can do, uh, we can do this by chaining together two or more built-in filters or by using an image processing kernel that we've written using, for example, metal shading language. Filters in core image, they're grouped in different categories. And these categories are also hard coded as a set of string constants. And these categories, they may include blur, color effects, uh, color adjustments, geometry adjustments, and many more. And each filter is in some category and sometimes even in more than one category. An interesting example of uh, effect categories is generators. They don't work with, with input images, but they can produce the new ones. They can generate QR and barcodes, and they can also generate solid colors. I actually see this being used in most apps where you need, for example, to generate QR code or anything else. You can do this by, by adding just simple core image filter and no third party no libraries. There's something to pay attention though. Uh, the first thing is an image extent. Basically, extent specifies the CA image bounds. 
uh, some CI images may have infinite extent. For example, the if you generate the, the solid color, you get the infinite so the, the, the infinite solid color. So basically, if you render this image uh, into UI image and then you put it to the um, UI image view, it won't show you anything. So you need to crop the image first, and then you need to render it and um, show to the user whenever you want. And the next thing to pay attention to is main thread uh, issues, main thread, I don't know, concerns maybe. Uh, because if you create a UI image from CA image directly, it creates like a temporary context to, to render this image, and it will block the, the main queue because it's a CPU-based context, context. And uh, if if you want to use like one filter or something like that, it probably won't take much time, so it's not your concern here. But uh, sometimes it's better to render uh, the, the image in a context somewhere in background and only then create a UI image from already rendered thing. So uh, that's it for, for the general knowledge uh, and now we'll try to look at some code a little bit. Uh, we're gonna take a look at a simple image recognition app and then we'll add a bit of image processing to it to make it better. Um, so what's here? We're gonna, see, we're gonna take a look at machine learning and why so? Because Apple actively advises developers to improve some intelligent features or new experiences or whatever but by leveraging on-device machine learning and it's actually a powerful stuff so you may want to take a look at it sometime and the project we're going to improve with the image processing is a, a super simple app that uses the drawing classification ml model provided by apple it's uh, stored somewhere on apple developer website so you can also download it if you want the model was trained on the NIST database of handwritten digits. So basically what it does, you show, you, you pass the image of a handwritten digit and it returns you the confidence uh, and also the value it thinks is displayed on the image. We're not gonna look at adding this model to the app and the whole ML integration specifics. If you want some more detailed information, I think you can refer to documentation. It's pretty thorough at this point there. So this is our app, not so beautiful, but still it, it does wh what it's supposed to. It displays a collection of images of handwritten digits and also the results of their recognition by this model. So as you may see, the results are not as good as would wish them to be. It's like one out of four, 25% of success. Uh, why does it happen? Mainly it happens because uh, we don't control the user input quality. So for us, these image, images are pretty obvious. So the numbers are readable there, but for the ML model, unfortunately, it's not so, so great. So ML models, they, they generally become better with training and everything, but we won't control the user input quality at all. Uh, so we're here to introduce a solution basically perform image pre-processing before recognizing the image. That's what we're going to do today. Uh, but before defining the set of methods, we need to apply the set of algorithms. Uh, we have to take a look at the data set that was used to train the model. Why so? Because for different models and for different goals, we'll probably need to concentrate on different image parts or features, because if we're working with a I know, docs classifications, we don't need to, to crop the image or to zoom it or anything else, doesn't matter. So the original NIST images, so the, the images that we used to train this model, they're, they fit in a 20 by 20 pixel box and they are also binarized. What, what does it mean? So a binary image, it's an image that consists of uh, pixels that can, can have exactly one of two colors. Usually it's black and white, but it also can be anything else. Uh, however, we have to also pay attention that the regular NIST database is mostly the black images on white background, but the Apple mod Apple's model was actually trained uh, on the other ones, on the black background uh, images with the white numbers. So it doesn't sound like really different from, from what we see here, but it differs when we classify the images. So basically, we've established that all our images need to be black and white binary images where white for the digit and black for the background. How to binarize an image? Uh, usually this is done by threshold operation. 
during the thresholding process, we take a look at the each color channel of each pixel. We we'll compare it with the chosen number, which is called the threshold. And if the value is higher than the threshold, it gets maximized for this color channel. If lower, it becomes zero. That's that's it. However, in a simple thresholding process, we need to provide the algorithm with the appropriate threshold number, so the number to compare with. But this number may differ even from image to image, not same from app to app. Uh, in some cases, it would be nice to give the user a chance to select this threshold, but in our case, it's not something we want to do because we don't even need to show the user that we perform some process in there. So we need the threshold to be automatically set by an algorithm. And in that case, the threshold should be the, the, the best, as it could be the best threshold in the case that the partition of pixels above the threshold and the, below the threshold that should match as closely as possible to the actual partition between the objects. So between the number and the background, between the pixels that represent the number and the background. There are many types of automatic thresholding, but the most widely used is OTSUS method. Uh, we're not going to look at its implementation because, fortunately, CI filter library has the, the filter we need here. It's called CI color threshold Otsu, and basically what it does is uh, find a single threshold for each image, then perform the threshold operation and pr pr provide the output for, for our app. However, as this filter accepts colored images, it also performs color thresholding. So whenever the input is color image, the output is colored image as well. But according to our model input requirements, we need our result, uh, resulting image to be black and white. So we need to perform like a middle step somewhere there. Basically, we need first to make our image grayscale and only then perform a threshold operation. In order to do this, we need to, to apply this formula you see here to, uh, to each pixel. And it's actually a pretty simple task, but somehow there is no filter in CA filter library for, for grayscaling, for simple grayscaling like this. So here well, here's comes the time where, when we have to do something on our own and we'll create a filter for this grayscaling operation here. Uh, so, to create and apply a kernel, an image processing kernel, we'll, we can use one of two languages. It's uh, either core image kernel language or metal shading language. Today we're going to take a look at the uh, process uh, of creating uh, the kernel with metal because it can achieve better performances sometimes because it's pre-compiled at build time, uh, while core image kernel language is compiled at runtime. So the main steps are the following. We have to first add some custom build rules to the project to enable metal. Then we have to create the metal source file, add the, the kernel there, and initialize and apply this kernel. So we're going to take a look at each step now. Basically, regarding the custom build rules, it's pretty simple. We have to add two flags in our uh, uh, well, flag flags options, one metal compiler and one metal linker. Uh, we have to do this because we need to enable metal to make it work. And one thing to note here, uh, uh, to test this, this project or anything uh, related to metal, we have to use the, the device that has metal because the simulator won't show anything here, so it won't work. Then we create a metal source file for our kernels. It looks like this. The name of the file doesn't matter, but the extension should be metal, obviously. And we also include the core image header here to access the classes provided by the framework. Uh, then our kernel needs to be inside an extrinsic enclosure uh, to make it accessible by name at runtime. So that's pretty much it. We can just declare all the um, kernels here uh, and make, make them work. So this is our grayscale kernel. We declared here, it takes an input of type sample t. Basically sample t, it's a um, four dimensional floating point vector, which represents red, green, blue, and opacity. That's, that's it. And it returns uh, a value of float four type, which is basically the same thing as sample t. They just have different names for it. Uh, here's how, how we calculate. We get the formula. You can find it somewhere in the internet. It's a weighted formula for grayscale in an image. And we take the needed color channel from the input pixel and apply this formula to them. That's, that's pretty much it. 
So then we declare a color kernel. We use the color one here because we modify only the color value. So we initialize it in our code using the, the API from, from core image framework. We need to get our default metal file here. And please note that it's not the file we created, that the naming is correct here, it should be default. Uh, it's basically a file that is formed automatically and it contains all the kernels we've written. And then we just create the color kernel using the function name, the grayscale kernel we use to, to declare our function. Um, that's pretty much it. We create a CA filter subclass with the kernel. We initialize the kernels there as we did in the previous step and we apply this kernel to an input image basically. And this is how we override the output image. So then we can use this filter the same way as we would use the regular core image filter. To get a desired result for, uh, for our app, we need to chain our filters together by first grayscaling an image and then thresholding it. But uh, know that we're working with CA images here, with CA filters, so the user input may be in some other format. For example, you may get a uh, UI image somehow, so you have to transform it firm, uh, first, convert it first. Uh, then we initialize our grayscale filter that we've created, pass CA image to get it processed and just return the, the output. So this is how it would look like uh, after grayscaling. Then this output, this grayscale image is passed as an input value for trash holding. Um, this filter is initialized by name as we can do with all system filters here. Uh, actually, there's also a simpler way to apply a filter to a CA image. Uh, this is how it looks. We can call applying filter function and pass the filter name there and we get the same output uh, that we will get by uh, key value observing. So result will be exactly the same here. But uh, one thing to note here, uh, the colors should be inverted. So we have to have the black background and the white image here. As we've already covered, uh, the background should be black. Uh, the the number should be white, so we need to apply something more, and there, there is this something more in the CA filter library. There is a CA color invert filter that can help us uh, just basically invert the colors in an image. And uh, it sounds like a not very important detail, but it's, it increases the recognition quality significantly. I've tested it, it's true. So this is all the steps we perform before passing the image to the ML model and here's the result we get. So there's no need to show these steps to the user. We can, we can just show the same images, but the classification, the, the recognition is much better. So all the numbers are recognized and even more the confidence is 100%. To me it looks pretty awesome. So you can see now that with just a small touch of digital image processing, we've added a like couple of steps here. We improved the app quality significantly. And of course, it's not something you need to do for every possible app you're working on because you may not even work with images there, but it's definitely worth checking out uh, because uh, uh, even though you can work on a filtering app, image filtering app, or you can work in an object detection app, which is actually not the, the image processing field, it's something you, uh, that can help you build better apps. So feel free to explore all the, all the existing image filters and don't be afraid to create your own filters. As you saw here, it's not so hard. And that's actually it from my side. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And if you have any questions left, it's, it's your time now. And you're probably as well. Yeah, and thank you.